Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. So that brings us to the question then, all right, so do I just throw up my hands and walk away, or do I think about a, a different way of engaging? And I think what you did in the book that's interesting is, is that you kind of turned our attention to the possibilities of culture making in, in, in serving and engaging and thinking locally about, about mm-hmm. impact as opposed to so globally. So elaborate on that. Yeah, and what I definitely don't want people to do is just throw out their hands and say, well, there's nothing we can do. Because, first of all, uh, I do believe God is transforming cultures. I think um, I think that's what it means to say God acts in history. Is that uh, I mean, history is just the story of culture over time, what people have made of the world over time. And we believe that God acts in history. And God involves people in his action. So, we should not at all um, so try to wash our hands of it or, or give up. But I think we need to ask, where is God prepared to use us? Um, and at, in one sense, the answer is God will use you wherever God will use you at whatever scale. And God does use a few people at very large scales. But for most of us, um, the overwhelming likelihood is that we will be used at a scale of culture, at a smaller scale than kind of, you know, a whole society or Western civilization or what have you, uh, because we're placed in, in much more specific locations where actually we can make a difference. We can't transform all of culture. Uh, but think about, let's, you know, really zoom down to the smallest, in some ways the fundamental unit of culture is the, the home. All of us, uh, whatever our current home life or household life is, all of us started out life and and acquired our cultural kind of heritage from a home of some sort. And our parents or whoever were were the sort of people who raised us had tremendous influence at that scale. So, I can do very little to change the culture of America. But I've done a great deal, for better or for worse, to change the culture um, of the lives of two kids named Timothy and Amy, who are 16 and 13. (laughs) And uh, for them, I really shape culture. I mean, I decide when we sit down to dinner. I decide what we have for dinner. I decide what we talk about at dinner. um, And all these are tremendously formative choices that I can make. Well, scale it up a little bit from that. All right, my home is in on a block. And on our block, uh, it's just outside the house where I'm sitting, there's about uh, about 10 houses. It's a small block. Uh, well, I have a, a lot to say about the culture of our block. When I, how often do I go outside? When I see my neighbors, how do I relate to them? Uh, do I greet them? Do I know their names? Do I know their stories? Um, do I invite them over? Uh, I have a lot of influence over the culture of this block, and not many other people, only about 10 other households, have that influence. So, when you, when you scale down from these vast you know, systems of culture, to the very local places where we are, you discover that pretty much all of us can do something where we are. Andy, the, a lot of times I work with a church, and churches will ask, how can I influence the culture around me? So if you take a, a particular local church that exists within the local culture, uh, how would they start to think about how can I have an influence on this culture around me? So, two thoughts. The first is, um, you'll do it the same way that culture has changed at every scale, and that's by by creating something, primarily. Uh, I'll put a footnote on that in a moment, but culture has changed when people make more culture. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, And and by that, I mean very concrete things. Uh, So, you need to ask, what could we add to the culture of our community that's not there right now? That would, that would move the horizons in some way, hopefully in a beneficial way. Now, the second thing is, so you have to make something very tangible in a way. Uh, the second thing is you've got to make it in public. So think about the culture of my block, just for me as a private citizen. Uh, right now, I'm sitting in my basement. If, if all the things that I create stay in my basement, 
<laughs> and sometimes as a writer, you worry that that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> but then people call you up on Skype and you think maybe it isn't all, all hopeless. Um, but uh, if, if I just stay in my basement, right, and I could create amazing things here, you know, but if I never take them out of my basement and share them with my neighbors, it's not going to change the culture of my blog. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that churches can, can one mistake that they can make is that they actually make uh, in-group culture. That is, uh, sometimes literally it happens in the church basement <laughs> right. uh, or in the fellowship hall or you know, family life center or whatever. And we wait for the culture around us to come to us. And, and of course, you can invite people in, and that's a very legitimate thing to do. But if you want to change the culture of com- your community, you have to make something that actually is out in public for your community. And you have to realize most people who aren't already connected with your church they drive by and your church is a black box to them or a beige or brown or, you know, whatever box. And they do not see anything that happens inside that box. They only see what touches their lives. So I hope that churches would start thinking about what could we create out in, in the public realm, not necessarily even our whole city, just our neighborhood, uh, that our neighbors could interact with, see, and have some sense of participation in because otherwise you're not changing the culture of your neighborhood you're just changing the culture of your church good point yeah i I think that this is uh, huge because i do think that ten churches tend they tend to be insular of course the, the tension that you have in a church is the tension between discipleship which tends to draw you inward and uh and evangelism, which tends to take you outward, and I think we we wrestle in, in our churches with this relationship. Uh, the churches that tend to be more inward focused and discipleship oriented are sometimes slow to step out. Another point that you make that I think is important is you talk about the importance of service in as a part of cultural engagement. And part of what we're talking about here is not just culture; we're talking about engaging the culture and engaging the culture in hel- helpful ways. And cultural engagement assumes <laughs> assumes engaging. I like to use the metaphor of an ambassador. An ambassador goes to a country, he represents another country by his presence, but he doesn't live in the embassy. I mean, he lives in the embassy, but he doesn't yeah. live in the embassy. Doesn't so, stay in the embassy. Exactly right. Yeah. He can't just park in the embassy and stay there and represent <laughs> his country well. He's got right. to interact with the country leaders. He's got to get to know the country and the culture. He's got to really engage. And I think sometimes when we think about cultural engagement, we we do it in a way where we where we tell the culture or we dictate to the culture or something like that and we don't engage the culture. We don't interact with the culture. And it's through the interaction and particularly the service which you highlight. I'm trying to bring these two ideas together. The service that we can do in the culture that we can create at least an impression of of a of a different kind of way of of living, yes. Mm-hmm. Which itself is an artifact. Go yes. ahead. Mm-hmm. No, that's. I think that's that's very good. And and actually, let me connect it back to to what you said a moment ago because I think this is a very important point. Uh, you said, and I, I totally understand why we we all think this way. But you said, you know, well, you have evangelism, which takes us out, but then you have discipleship, and that tends to happen more inside. And I would actually say we've got to change the way we think about that. And we need to recognize that discipleship actually crucially involves the way we live outside. Absolutely. It's mission. If mission isn't a part of discipleship, you're not being a disciple. And the greatest thing that most church leaders are overlooking (laughs) right now is the discipleship realities, I might say of where their people spend most of their time, which is in the culture, in their neighborhoods, Absolutely. in their workplaces, uh, in school. You know, you, you, we have people for maybe a morning and an evening, or you know, maybe a little more than that in, in a typical week at church. And the rest of the time, they're out in the world. But what's happening out in that world? They are being challenged to um, create things. That's what work is, uh, cultivating and creating, take, taking care of what's already there and adding to it. Um, they're doing that not just in paid work, but in volunteering and participating participation in the community as well as their homes. 
And we have often not seen that every one of those places where people are is a, is a venue either, well, it's a venue for discipleship of some sort. <laughs> you're going to be conformed to some image. Either you're going to, to live that, live out your work, live out your, your volunteer service in your community, live out your life at home, uh, shaped by the gospel or shaped by other values and by other cultures in a way. And so we're, we're neglecting this vast uh, arena for discipleship, which is where our people are spending most of their time, because we don't talk about it, and we often can't envision it, or we don't we don't have a Christian imagination for it. Um, you know, you might say that what actually happens in the church is a it's a subset of discipleship, and we may, maybe the word to use is formation. You know, that I need to be formed by the gospel through worship, through study, through prayer, through fellowship. But formation is just a small part of discipleship, and discipleship should take me out into the place where I work and the places where I live and, and spend my life, and it's there that I either bear witness to the gospel in everything that I do, or I don't. So, we need to reframe it so that we think of discipleship as mostly happening out there, uh, not just happening in here. Now, I've got two Andys here on the other side of these mics, so it's, um, uh, so I'm going to turn to Andy Seidel here a second and, and ask him a question. You know, you were a pastor for a while, and when you listen to what Andy is saying and you hear him talk about, you know, the way in which we tend – I actually think this is a way in which culture's impacted us. We've almost secularized our lives in the mm -hmm. way our culture has taught us to secularize our lives. So there's the stuff that I do in church, and it's separate from the state over here, what right. I do in my life. Right. Now, when you listen to this, Andy, and you think about the pastor, Andy Seidel, um, what what are you hearing that makes you think, maybe I can I should be preaching differently, or maybe I should be communicating differently? How do I, how do I help people to think holistically, if I can use that word, about the way in which their lives work and their discipleship works? What do you, what do you, what do you sense from our conversation uh, is, the, is the takeaway for a pastor who's thinking about teaching and preaching? Well, I think mainly it is to think about the people that you are preaching to. They spend most of their lives out there, outside of the church. And so the idea is, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to really focus on that and how they represent Jesus Christ in you know, that secular world. So the illustrations the that you engage in when you teach sure. and preach have to engage the life of your community and has to challenge them. You know, I hear a lot of preaching where we talk about what happens in the home. You know yes. that we, we do right. that we do that pretty well, but then the but question: then What question, happens in the church? What happens not in the church? And then even more: What happens <laughs> in the uh, nine to five uh, time that you spend at work? Uh, your forty hours a week, which is your major. If I can say energy investment outside your family right. that you engage in, what does that look like? Do you help your people in the church? Uh, imagine and envision what that life could be like connected to their walk with God. Do we do enough of that when we preach? No, we don't do nearly enough of that, and we need to do that <clears throat> because that's the primary way that we influence the world. Yeah. So, and, and you know, I would add <laughs> uh, yeah. some interesting studies have been done on on how pastors talk about the wider world. And I and Daryl, you made a very good point that the home. Actually, we talk a fair amount about uh, there's a kind of sense of responsibility yeah. for helping people with discipleship in the home. But uh, Scotty McLennan and Laura Nash wrote this book called Church on Sunday, Work on Monday. Hmm. Uh, and they looked at how um, pastors addressed issues of work, the nine to five work. They found that most pastors didn't mention it <laughs> for you know weeks on end. You, it's the black you, hole of right. life. Go a long time. Yes, and but see, then, most most pastors have no experience of that because they don't know that world. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then when they did mention it, it was always framed negatively. Uh, especially the world of business was framed as mostly a matter of greed. And so, gosh, if you're in the business world, boy, it must be hard, you know, just with all that greed surrounding you all the time. <laughs> well. There is greed in business. Uh, there's also greed in the church, That's by right. the way. <laughs> just, just a That's touch. Right. Uh, but there's a lot of other things going on, and most business people, most days, are not they, they are not seeing their work primarily through the lens of greed. And you know, here's the other thing. I while I was writing my book, I started listening to my the sermons I was hearing in my church, and I go to a, a 
a fairly prosperous suburban church, a lot of people who are quite successful in their work world and influential in their work world. As Andy said, there's a lot of influence going on here. Um, and I started listening for the, the anecdotes in the sermons that, mm-hmm. that um, where, you know, there was an illustration of faithfulness in one way or another. And I think in 18 months, I did, and this is just one church, but I did not hear a single illustration of someone who behaved in a notably faithful way where that person was not a pastor, uh, a missionary, or a volunteer in some way. Wow. And at, there was one time where uh, I, the, the illustration began by talking about this guy who was a successful small business owner and was sort of fair to his employees and his business did really well. I thought, ah, I'm about to, you know, they're breaking the streak. We're about to get a really great example of a faith. <laughs> Finally, faithful. an yeah. exception. <laughs> and then the punchline was he sold his business and, and went to Bolivia as a missionary. And I thought, oh, you were so close. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. This is not atypical. We do not tell stories about people right. positively influencing the right. world through their activity in the world. And I think sometimes it's because we need to recruit volunteers for the church. <laughs> and so we make the world sound worse than it is in order to make the church sound better than it is. Oh, that's, uh, in- yeah, that's interesting. You know, there are, there are a couple of ways that you can deal with this. One is to think through, you know, a lot of business uh, is about relationships and network building and that kind of mm-hmm. thing. It's not, it's not the exchange of goods that happens. It's the relationships that are built in the midst of doing that work. Yes. And we, we, need to, we need to invest that with a, with a value and with an appreciation, uh, like we do the relationships in our homes, uh, yes. and, and and give it the same kind of attention. That's one way I think we can do it is to encourage pastors to think about how they talk about the the business uh, business life and business square where most people live. And the second thing is, you know, there are times in churches where you can have. Uh, testimonies and people talk about their lives, well, yeah. why not interview the people who are out there in the public right. square who are making right. the effort and who, who, can, who know that world rather than the pastor doing it secondhand? And, and, and cre- again, creating – you're talking about creating an artifact. You're creating an environment in the church that nurtures the whole of life as people are living it. Isn't that really what we're discussing here? Yeah, absolutely. I, I will say what you'll find when you uh, – set out to interview people um, like that, which I think is a wonderful idea, is that most of them have never been given the vocabulary to talk about mm. what they're doing in a Christian frame. They've, they've had to just sort of make it up as they go along. So be prepared um, for folks to not be able to articulate why what they do is significant in kingdom terms, not because it isn't significant, and not because they aren't faithful in how they do it, but the church has never given them the language. Right. So, so we need to start giving people the language for why what they do um, every day, wh- whether they're you know a mom who, who works primarily in the home and in the neighborhood, or someone who runs a business, or a lawyer, or an accountant. Um, by the way, accountants are always the, the, the hard question people ask me. They say, <laughs> how can you do accounting you know, as a Christian? Who, you know? and, and I say, look, it's about um, honesty. Uh, it's about having the virtue of being willing to say things that are hard. When you'd rather sort of shade the truth, it's about keeping people committed to the truth about how their businesses are going. This is a deeply Christian thing to do. Um, and when people don't do it faithfully, uh, people end up being lied to and, and businesses end up being destroyed. So, every field, there's a way to do it and to think about it theologically, but we haven't given them ways to do that. So, don't be alarmed if you find that people aren't very articulate at first. Um, help them discover why what they're doing matters um, in, in the work of the kingdom. Well, I think that what we've kind of articulated by doing what we've done today is to show how you can think about cultural engagement on kind of this global CNN scale, okay? <laughs> or, or you can think about it in a completely different way. And in thinking about it in a completely different way, there there's the opening up potential for avenues of thinking about cultural engagement in ways you've never thought about cultural engagement before. And in doing so, the possibilities then open up to create these fresh artifacts or these fresh experiences of life that are that are now 
uh, that are now open to what God is doing into theological engagement in a way that you weren't thinking about before. I think that's that that's where your book pushes us. Is that mm -hmm. is that a fair summary of the kind of intent of what you were after in terms of getting people to think about culture and cultural engagement? Yeah, beautifully said. And I think uh, – our churches, the people in our churches, are waiting for someone to unfold this to them. Uh, yeah, and you know what you said is right. I mean, if you just think about culture as CNN or Fox or MSNBC or whatever, you'll get really depressed. <laughs> um, but if you think about it as the spheres where God has placed us and the scales that we have influence over, be they small or large, and that God has placed us there to, you know, the language I like is to be image bearers in those places. This is tremendously uh, good news. And people are not hearing about this from their pastors, but they could. And it, it opens up a, a lot in Scripture that we haven't touched. So, it's, uh, it's just good leadership to start addressing these things in our churches. Oh, you yeah. just used the word leadership. I mean, he's me yeah. to hand it over to. Andy. <laughs> Andy, what what if what advice would you give to leaders as you as you reflect on on what Andy and we have been discussing? Well, I think one thing in, in terms of church leaders, pastors, is to develop relationships with the business people in their church so that they know more what's going on and so they could incorporate some of things uh, uh, from the business world into their messages and talk about how this applies uh, in the home, but also outside the home in the business. I, I think one of the things that's very interesting is that <clears throat> if we have a, a concern about reaching people, a lot of times they will listen more to a Christian business person in their own uh, realm of experience than they will to a pastor because we're we're different. Yeah, we're seen as being disconnected That's from right. life, and it's 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 an irony. The pastor is seen as being disconnected from life, even though that's the voice they right. often hear in the church. And then the pastor gets up and doesn't connect to that life that the, most of the people are living, and so you get a disconnect. Uh, well, th we've literally only scratch the surface <laughs> in our time together in, in thinking about this. And Andy, I appreciate uh, your spending time with us there from a distance and, and, and connecting with us by Skype, something that wouldn't have been possible 15 years ago, a good illustration <laughs> of a cultural go. artifact. And, and hopefully, maybe in the future we can talk more about this, because I know this is a passion that we all share in helping the church think through how really is the best way to engage culture and to think about it differently than the way they normally do. So thank you very, very much. Well, thanks for everything you're doing. This is a wonderful conversation. So glad to be part of it. Well, we're glad to have you here at the table, and we're glad you were able to join us at the table, and we look forward to inviting you back for our next video cast. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.